This week, laser and lens replacement eye surgery. Thousands of successful operations are performed each year. But what happens when things go wrong? We'll be hearing some of the horror stories that have unfolded after corrective eye operations didn't go to plan. Also, the thousands of private tenants living in appalling conditions. We'll hear about the UK's slum landlords. Across the UK. This is BBC Radio Five Live. Five Live Investigates with Adrian Goldberg. Do you wear glasses or contact lenses? Wish you could see perfectly without them. Well, that's the promise held out by laser and lens replacement eye surgery. And thousands of people have successful operations to improve their sight every year. But as Five Live Investigates has been finding out, not everyone is getting the life-changing experience they wanted, with some patients complaining of worse sight after undergoing the procedure and suffering unwanted side effects and serious pain. As always, we want your stories. If you've had corrective eye surgery, how was it for you? You can email goldberg at bbc.co.uk, text us on 85058 or on social media. We're at BBC Five Live. Let's hear first from Amanda from Cumbria. She paid £1,000 for laser eye treatment when she went to one high street specialist seven years ago. It corrected her vision, but she's since suffered from side effects. She doesn't want to name the company which operated on her because she still relies on them for help with drops and ointments. I asked her what happened after the procedure. I thought everything was fine, but about three months afterwards, I woke up one morning and I couldn't open my left eye. I'd never experienced anything like it, like the pain I had. It was as though I had, like, glass stabbing me in the eye, so I couldn't see what I was, where I was going or anything like that, so I was complete in blindness, which was totally terrifying for me. I ended up being tucked to uh, my local hospital and what they said was I had was a corneal abrasion. And was this definitely linked to the laser eye surgery? Well, I'd never had any problems with anything like this until after this surgery. And on the disclaimers, it does say possibility of dry eye, but the way they make it sound is all that if you do get dry eye, it's not going to be a problem or it's something maybe drops could sort out. I've had... Every eye drop under the sun. I'm constantly having to put eye gel in at night time. During the last seven years, I've had a number of attacks, which I know what's coming. I've got another corneal abrasion, and that sets me back every time for six weeks because I can't see. When when it's bad, I have to be, like, put on the toilet by my, my husband. I have to be bathed. I have to be dressed by him and I have to be fed by him as well because I can't do any of these things myself when I get these bad attacks. So this has been an ongoing thing for me now. What happens to me on a daily basis, it's got the potential every morning when I wake up, I'm not sure how I'm going to be. And like I say, dry eye to people might just think it's a little bit of dry eye, but if you get it, like I've got it, and it is severe... It is life-changing, totally life-changing, because it also affects my sleeping patterns. What I find is if I try to lie down flat, it seems like the eye dries out even more. So now my pillars are actually elevated up at night so I I can try and get some sleep. Since this has happened to me, all my sleep has been broken because I'm constantly waking up through night, so it's totally destroyed my quality of life. If I would have known that this would have happened to me to the extent it it has done, there's no way I would have went for this surgery. You know, the eyesight's better. It's done what the job it said it was going to do, which was correct the short-sightedness. But now I've been left with a lifelong condition that nobody would like to have. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And obviously people go through their own things in life, but this has been by far the worst thing I've ever had to face. That's Amanda's story, and Nicola Dowling's been looking at this for us. So, Nicola, how many people are having these kinds of corrective eye surgery? Well, what we're talking about here, Adrian, is elective eye surgery. That's surgery that people choose to have rather than surgery that they have to have. And so it's usually carried out privately rather than on the NHS. As a result, the numbers aren't collected anywhere centrally, but it's estimated that around 100,000 people are choosing to have laser eye or replacement lens surgery privately every year. And high street providers are making it really accessible with clinics in some of the big shopping centres. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the vast majority 
of those procedures are very successful. But what kind of things are happening when things don't go according to plan? Well, I've spoken to a number of people who say their eyesight is worse after surgery than it was beforehand. So instead of being glasses free, which is what they all hoped for, they're having to wear not even just one pair of glasses, sometimes two or three at different times of the day. Some say they can't drive at night anymore. Some complain of severe headaches and pain. And I've been speaking to Craig Meller. He's a TV cameraman from Manchester who went to the UK's market leaders in this field, Optical Express. He had laser surgery so that he wouldn't have to wear glasses for work, but he says things went wrong very quickly afterwards. The next morning I woke up and noticed in my left eye that there was something really not right. I had a crease in the actual flap that they'd cut uh, to laser the eye and they had to do another operation within 24 hours to actually remove the crease from the flap of the eye. I then had the first lens replacement in my left eye. As soon as I I took the bandage off my eye to clean it in the morning to go back for the checkup, I noticed what appeared to be a black arc, and all my peripheral vision had gone, and it was completely black. I've raised complaints with their head people, and they either don't get back to you or fob you off and tell you, don't worry, you're under our complex case management team, they're the best in the country, Uh, they will get you right. They will they, they basically sort your vision and they've promised me that now for six and a half years. 50% of the problems have been caused by the initial laser and I think the other 50% have been caused by surgeons not putting the correct prescription in or even the correct make or brand of lenses. So that's cameraman Craig Meller. He's now asked the doctor's watchdog, the GMC, to investigate his case. And we'll hear later from the global medical director of Optical Express, Steve Shalhorn. Uh, Nicola, what have the company, though, said about Craig's particular case? Well, the company initially said it couldn't comment on individual cases, but after we trailed Craig's story on Five Live on Friday, they came back to us and refuted some of his claims. They say the problems he encountered are wholly unconnected with any error or insufficiency in relation to the initial laser eye surgery. They also dispute that the wrong prescription or brand of lens was used. They also say that out of 27,000 customers recently surveyed by the company, only 0.7% experienced a problem. So are there any industry-wide figures for the number of people who've had issues after surgery? Well, again, the companies I spoke to say the vast majority of people don't have a problem and they're absolutely delighted with the results, but there are no independent comprehensive figures on this. I'm, I'm puzzled by that. I mean, surely someone must compile figures. Who's responsible for regulating the industry? Well, there are a number of different bodies which have a level of oversight. Um, If there are complaints against an individual surgeon, that's looked into by the General Medical Council. Optometrists, those are the people who assess eye conditions and treatments but don't carry out the operations, are regulated by the General Optical Council. And then there's the Care Quality Commission. They inspect premises and regulate the industry. There are no figures available, though, and I've checked with all these people. Mm. Uh, we spoke uh, a little earlier as well to Sasha Rodoy. She runs websites providing help and support for people who have suffered problems as a result of laser and lens replacement eye surgery. Over the last two years, I have been contacted by hundreds and hundreds of people with problems, both from laser and RLE, which is refractive lens exchange, which is basically cataract surgery. What kind of things have people been telling you? They have dry eyes, they've got ectasia, they've got um, detached retinas, uh, starbursts, ghosting halos, MGD, which is my and gland disease. It's, the list is endless. People, having heard what you've got to say, Sasha, and listening to the experiences we've highlighted on the show today, might say, but there is bound to be a risk whenever you're involved with eye surgery, and people would understand that. Unfortunately, people are not told exactly how high the risk is. The industry claim there's a 99% success rate. Even if you accept that the industry say there's 1% complication, if you accept that, that's still 10 times higher than that of routine surgery, such as a hysterectomy. But there are no statistics. So you believe that many people simply aren't made fully aware of the risks associated with that surgery? People are most definitely not made aware of the risks. The risks are dismissed. 
I'm told time and time again the same stories over and over again. Oh, they told me that my eyes were perfect for this. There'd be no problems. Don't worry. The the problems are so rare. I actually spoke to somebody by coincidence last week, and they thought they were the only person who had problems until I explained, well, actually, you're one of thousands. But again, the company responsible for damaging their eyes had let them believe that that this was a very rare occurrence. It is far from it. Sasha, you speak with such passion about this. Are you operating a vendetta? (laughs) I'm not sure about a vendetta. All I want is regulation. I want people to be warned about the risks of this surgery and they, they have to be fully informed. If people are fully informed and then they decide they're willing to take that risk, so be it. But people are not being fully informed. I will not rest until I see the government regulate this industry. That's campaigner Sasha Rodoy talking to me a little earlier. Let's bring in Professor Harminder Dua. He's the president of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, which has drawn up good practice guidelines. Professor Dua, good morning. Good morning. Is is Sasha right to say then that we need more regulation? Uh, Absolutely. I think uh, there are various aspects of this industry which are good, uh, the good people working in it, but there are many, many aspects of it which are not so good. And those, uh, in the the absence of regulation, continue to persist and not be dealt with as they should. When when you talk about the absence of regulation, I mean, we have got the General Medical Council, we've got the Care Quality Commission. These are serious organisations, aren't they, with with oversight? They they, they regulate the performance of the doctors mostly after the event. Um, They have good guidelines which doctors are meant to practice, but if things go wrong and there are system failures and not individual failures, they're not picked up. You mentioned earlier, nobody knows figures of complications and how many procedures are being done, etc. What, what kind was, what, Go on, sorry. No, if there was some kind of regulation and we would collect the statistics, if everybody has to report to a central body the problems that occur, um, then it would give us some handle on the size of the scale of the problem and how to address that. What kind of things have you seen? So what kind of what kind of things have you seen that have given you oh, cause yeah. for concern? Oh, in in my practice, I get a lot of referrals from people who've had problems, and uh, there are uh, people who've uh, you know the, the, there's a, a person who was suffering from cancer, was on treatment for cancer with cancer drugs, which raised the risk of infection, and was for a low refractive error given bilateral LASIK surgery, ended up with infection in both eyes. Clearly, this lady was or was not appropriate for treatment at the time. There was another patient who had a disease of the back of the eye. It's called an endothelial dystrophy, which was not picked up, had fairly moderate degree of uh, laser correction given, ended up with cornea transplants in both eyes. So pretty involved uh, major surgery afterwards to set right what went wrong. Um, the, the, so the issues really with, with the high street uh, providers is that there is a lack of continuity of care. The person who does the initial counseling is also a salesperson. And there's a lot of high pressure tactics involved to bring patients in for surgery. Thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. That's Professor Harminda Dua. And coming up a little later, uh, we will hear from the Global Medical Director of the UK's market leader in corrective eye surgery. On DAB Digital Radio, Digital TV, downloads and online. This is BBC Radio Five Live. Five Live Investigates with Adrian Goldberg. On Five Live Investigates today, laser and lens replacement eye surgery. Around 100,000 people have the op every year to avoid living with glasses or contact lenses. And though most are successful, as we've been hearing, some patients are left to live with severe side effects. And there are concerns there isn't enough protection for customers when things go wrong. Getting your texts and emails, Nicola Dowling alongside me. Uh, What are people saying, Nicola? Well, there's one here from Paul in Leeds. He said, had laser eye surgery, best thing I ever did. Able to play football and go bird watching without glasses. My two passions in life. Yeah, and Adrian Jennings in Perrinporth in Cornwall says I paid £3,500 for corrective eye surgery with Optical Express. Best money I ever spent. Never look back. Glasses in the bin. Not everybody's quite so complimentary about the procedures, though. No, indeed. Um, we've got someone here... Um 
they had lens replacement by one of the high street providers. They said that their eyesight had been totally ruined and one of the best eye surgeons in the world has told them that they should never have had the operation in the first place. They say they can't name them as they've signed a gagging order so that the company would pay for another operation. Um, it hasn't worked out though and they still see um, starbursts and they have blurred vision. And Rachel says, I've suffered severe corneal complications after two attempts at eye surgery which cost me over £5,000. I have a higher order aberration which cannot be corrected. Keep those comments coming. You can text us on 85058 or email goldberg at bbc.co.uk. Now earlier Amanda told us that she had had laser treatment at one high street specialist and it was successful in correcting her vision but she has been left with debilitating side effects if i would have known that this would have happened to me to the extent it has done there's no way i would have went for this surgery because now i've been left with a lifelong condition that was amanda let's hear now from rob biffer from buckinghamshire he went to a different company to amanda he went to optical express he had worn glasses for 15 years and paid four and a half thousand pounds for lens replacement surgery rob good morning to you you're right yeah, fine. Yeah, so what happened to you, my friend? Right. Um, I went to my local optician and had my eyes tested, and they just adjusted my lenses accordingly. But I had it in the back of my mind that um, that I wanted something extra done. And I went to Optical Express, and they said I needed um, two multifocal lenses, one in each eye. That was four and a half thousand pounds, by the way. Um, It must be 50 million to one for actually both operations to go wrong. So what actually happened to you? Right. Well, my right eye was operated on and that is um, still reasonable and I can see with it, although it still needs actual laser surgery. But my left eye is totally cloudy. I cannot drive. I cannot read. I have to use special magnifiers on the computer and also a special speech program to uh, dictate any messages. But listen, Rob, uh, very unfortunate side effects that you're telling us about. You know, this is an eye operation. Things can go wrong. Were you informed about the possible side effects? Well, they do make you sign a waiver. Um, However, um, if somebody has not properly assessed you in the first place, that doesn't mean anything. And quite frankly, um, after the operation, they thought that I had some infection and they sent me to my doctor to see if I had any uh, arthritic conditions Um, And uh, Dr. Britton said, why did they not actually ask me this question beforehand? Rob, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Nicola, that's an unfortunate story, isn't it? Surely this is all about informed consent, isn't it? Somebody sitting you down and explaining what might happen. That's right. The guidelines published by the Royal College of Ophthalmology say potential patients should be able to sit down with the surgeon that is going to do the procedure before the day of surgery and there should be a cooling off period. But the majority of people I spoke to say they weren't given that chance. They had prior appointments but not with the surgeon that was going to do the operation. And they say that although the risks were sometimes explained, they weren't outlined in detail and were quite often played down. So what if people decided that the risks were too great? Well, I've spoken to two patients who did get to speak to the surgeons, but just literally before the surgery was due to take place, moments before. Um, both decided against going ahead, um, but as a result of that, they were told they couldn't get the money back. Here's Daryl Gill from Sheffield, who paid £2,490. I've been thinking about having laser eye surgery, you know, because I play golf, and the problem with glasses when you play golf is that they get steamed up, or when it rains, they get rain on them. And it's, uh, it's, it's awkward. And I thought, laser eye surgery, I've got a bit of money, I'll go for it. So I was in Meadowall in Sheffield, uh, passing the Optical Express, saw the signs, went in, inquired about laser eye surgery. They, they checked my eyes out. It was like a consultation. I spoke to this uh, optometrist and uh, she said I was a good candidate. So on that basis, uh, I, I went, said I'd, I'd uh, like to go ahead with it. So I paid up there and then, on the day, 2000 £490. Came back, 
16 days later, checked out my eyes again. They did a, a mapping of my eyes, scanned my eyes. The surgeon then took me into this little room and asked me why I wanted laser eye surgery. So I explained to him that um, about the golf. And at this point, he sort of tutted and shook his head a little bit. and sat, He came and sat very, very close to me and started speaking a bit furtively. And he said, look, with laser eye surgery, he said, because yours is only a very small prescription, he said, I can only get you plus or minus this 0.25 on this prescription. And I says, what do you mean? He says, well, he says, he put these, um, a block of nine letters up on, on the board, on, a, on the wall, lit this, uh, these letters up, three rows of three. He says, you can read the top line, can't you? I says, yes. He says, you have trouble with the next two down. I says, yes. He says, for me to get you to that bottom level, he says, there's only a 50% chance of me getting you there. That's glasses free. Um, I said, well, that's not very good odds. That's not the odds I was told when I, uh, when I saw this optometrist. I just said, well, this is no good for me. I says, I've paid £2,490 to be glasses free and you're only giving me a 50% chance of that achieving that. On that basis, I, I'm not prepared to go ahead with, with this. I want a refund, I want my money back, I've been missold. Uh, Daryl, believing then he was missold the benefits, Nicola, has he got his money back? No, he thought it was reasonable to expect that because he'd only seen the surgeon just moments before and had the risk spelled out to him then, that he would be able to get his money back. But he's been told no. I'm told it says in the small print that if you cancel just before the procedure, you can't get your money back. He would argue, I was only given the full information then, so that's not fair. OK, let's speak to the Labour MP, John McDonnell, who's calling for tougher regulation in this area. John, good morning. Good morning. So what are your concerns? Um, let me just explain, this hasn't come up recently this goes back to 2005 when my colleague the late frank cook held a parliamentary investigation into the industry and there was a witch report which reported many of the concerns that you've raised this morning and recommended regulation at that stage um, over the years the the concerns have grown rather than lessened the industry doesn't seem to be complying with the recommendations which came out of those original inquiries. So now the government has undertaken a review of cosmetic surgery generally. It looked at laser eye surgery and is recommending now that there is the Royal Society of Ophthalmology is brought in to advise on how we go forward here with regard to regulation. And so so is, what, what specific let, things let need to, to be the, done, Exactly. John. Let me just go through the points that, that we're looking at. Uh, one is, first of all, exactly as you said, informed consent. Are patients given accurate and full information before they make the decision? That's the first thing. The second issue, and, and many have claimed that they haven't. These are allegations, but there are too many now not to ignore. In addition to that, some of the information, there have been complaints to the Advertising Standard Agency about the information that has been provided by the companies, and those complaints have been upheld over the years as well. That's the first. And the second thing is about aggressive sales tactics, where people go in and then they, they think they're simply going in to find out about information. Then after that, they receive phone call after phone call after phone call. And then some of those aggressive sale tactics in include offering cosmetic procedures like laser eye surgery as competition pr prizes with deadlines so people feel under pressure to actually purchase them uh, 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 within a deadline itself. The third thing is there should be an assessment that's carried out by the surgeon that will eventually undertake the surgery and then also look after the aftercare as well. Too often it is a salesperson that's undertaking the first assessment, then after that another person undertakes a separate assessment and then the surgeon operates. Again, what the Professor Durr said, there needs to be consistency of approach. In addition to that, I found it very worrying that the Royal Society brought out a certification process. I now discover that only half of the surgeons operating actually have that qualification, have been certificated in that way. I find that deeply worrying. In addition to that, there should be a cooling off period between when a person decides they want the operation and before the operation takes place. That enables them then to consider their options properly. There is a cooling off period, but it's not abided by, we're told, on many occasions. That's the allegation that's been made. So there's this. Two, two things, John, there. One yes. is that uh, people inside the industry would argue that this isn't cosmetic. You know, we are talking about a, a serious health issue. This isn't a cosmetic procedure. But also, we have a level of reg regulation, don't we? We have the General Medical Council, we have the Care Quality Commission, uh, we have the Optical uh, Society as well. The group rep represents and disciplines optometrists. So there's, there's no shortage of regulation in this area. Some people might argue there's too much. Well, it's not statutory regulation. A lot of it is codes of practice and guidance, and it's not legally enforceable. And what happens 
is that when things go wrong, as you've discovered this morning, when things go wrong, people can't then speak out because often the company will, or the companies will force them to sign compromise agreements that then has a gagging clause in it and you can't get accurate information. And as you've pointed out this morning, there doesn't seem to be any statistical assessment of what's going on out there. The companies publish their statistics about satisfaction rates, but again there have been allegations made now that those surveys are undertaken well, by patients themselves are under pressure, but in addition to that, there are now allegations that some of those forms are actually filled in by staff themselves. That's why I agree with the professor from the Royal Society. We need now statutory regulation of the whole industry, and we need openness and transparency. For example, we need openness and transparency about how many operations an individual surgeon is taking a day. We've been told there could be anything up to 17 to 20 operations a day by individual surgeries. OK, John, thank you. The MP John McDonnell. On DAB Digital Radio, Digital TV, downloads and online. This is BBC Radio Five Live. Five Live Investigates. Coming up on Five Live Investigates, we're living in 2014, but tens of thousands of tenants are still living in squalor. So why is the government doing so little to make private landlords improve the state of rented flats and houses? First, though, your reaction to our story about corrective eye surgery. Our reporter Nicola Dowling's alongside me, sifting what you've had to say, Nicola. Yep, we've got one here. It says, I'm an independent optometrist and I have many patients who ask me about corrective eye surgery. I have no financial benefit either way, but I feel the key message is managing patients' expectations. Martin in Reading says, I had my eyes corrected in 2008. I was very short-sighted at the time. My contact lenses had started to dry out, so decided surgery was my best option. I'd gone to Optical Express to get excessed, which I was in the ideal group for. The wavefront surgery was performed. By the end of the day, I could see with clarity... It was genuinely life-changing and I can't fault it at all. We've got a message here from Glenda. She said, I had surgery. It cost me over £3,000. After effects, absolutely horrendous. Like being stabbed in the eyes with pins. Swollen face. I complained, but I was fobbed off and told it was a very, very unusual reaction. All the side effects not fully explained and they get you to sign a disclaimer minutes before you go into surgery. That's an ideal time to bring in Steve Shalhorn from Optical Express. They describe themselves as the UK's number one provider of laser eye surgery. Steve, good morning. Uh, thank you again. Good morning. And as we've heard that, you know, two emails, Martin in Reading tell us it had changed his life for the better. Glenda telling us that unfortunately uh, her corrective surgery has left her with lifelong problems. Well, listen, yeah, I think it's uh, it's important to provide a little bit of balance here. Laser eye surgery has improved the lives of millions of people and hundreds of thousands in the UK. Uh, it's a shame that some of those folks haven't uh, been on the show to share their experience. Uh, the vast majority of our patients tell us that they would recommend Optical Express. But as you've heard, you know, the, the surgery, as in all surgery, carries risks of complications. Uh, fortunately for laser eye surgery, that risk is very low. The suggestion is, though, Steve, and no one's denying that many thousands of people have successful laser eye surgery, but the suggestion is that on too many occasions, the risks, the potential side effects are not made known to your customers and the people doing the counselling are, in fact, salespeople. Well, they're not salespeople. They're eye care professionals. But listen, we're committed to ensuring that patients provide their informed decision about whether to undergo surgery. And the consent process, uh, the, the informed consent is really a process. This process starts even before the patient shows up uh, for a consultation with, uh, with information that's available, written information. Uh, we have new informational and consent videos that we provide. There's a discussion with the optometrist. There's a discussion with the surgeon. And, of course, the very end and what you're talking about is the informed consent document. But also the guidelines suggest that people should see the surgeon carrying out the operation ahead of the day in which the procedure is being carried out. Would you accept that that doesn't always happen? Well, listen, I think the mechanism and the process we have in place um, – ensures patients have a proper informed consent but you know we're but always those, those are the guidelines aren't they from the royal college of ophthalmology do you accept that on some occasions you don't follow those guidelines listen any patient that wants to see a surgeon before the day of surgery is welcome to do so and we certainly accommodate those patients but you don't routinely provide that access we make that available to all our patients 
do you offer that proactively to every patient? If, yes, if the patient would like to see the surgeon, we do offer that. Yes, the answer to that is yes. But, you know, the, the other thing it's important to appreciate, too, is that, you know, in this process, that we, we have rigorous standards that have been established by our medical advisor board. We don't treat everybody that comes to us for those reasons. And over the past five years, we've declined to treat over 150,000 patients that we felt were not suitable for laser eye surgery or that we could not meet their expectations. Listen, if we were cavalierly pushing people into surgery, we would treat all of them instead of, instead of pushing back patients that we thought we couldn't manage their expectations, they could not provide informed consent for us properly, or we thought they wouldn't have a good outcome. Would you welcome then greater regulation of your industry? Because presumably you feel that you would have nothing to fear if there were stricter rules. Well, first, I, I think there is good regulation in the industry, despite what we heard earlier. Uh, I think there is there, listen, there's protections in place to protect patients. The General Medical Council, uh, the, the Care Quality Commission is one. They have a formal process for patient feedback or complaints that are followed. But with that said, I agree with you. Listen, we would support practical regulations that, that, that would improve the industry and deliver meaningful benefits to our patients. We would certainly support that. Do you accept that in the past some of your adverts have been misleading? You know, I, I'm a surgeon, and I can't, I can't really offer insight into advertising. But, but I do know that we have a positive relationship with the Advertising Standards Authority and are committed well, It's not to, that positive, is it? I mean, you've fallen foul of them on two occasions. And in 2012, they said that your companies claimed that 99% of patients achieve 2020 vision could no longer be used by the company because it is misleading. Well, actually, one of the most common uh, complaints we had... Uh, was we were saying that we were uh, the the market leader in the UK, and that ended up being that that was a major issue for them. Uh, well, I think, I think our listeners would be I, the case. I think our listeners would be less concerned about your role as market leader or not than in your misleading claim that ninety nine percent of patients achieve twenty twenty vision. That is a claim that you made in your advertising that the Advertising Standards Authority said that you must not use. You've been misleading. Your patients? No, we have not been misleading our patients. That claim of 99% has been borne out with analysis that we've conducted. 99% of our patients achieve 2020 vision after you can't, surgery. You can't use that claim anymore. The ASA has said that you're not allowed to use it. It's misleading. Well, again, you know, I'm a I'm a ophthalmic surgeon, and I can't address the advertising issues. But I will say that 99% of our patients achieve 2020 vision. It's not 99% of all of your patients, is it? It's 99% of a sample of well, your patients, and the ASA say you can't use that claim anymore. It's 99% of, uh, of the most common type of patients that we treat achieve 2020 vision. Steve Shalom, thanks very much indeed for joining us from Optical Express. On DAV Digital Radio, Digital TV, 